26 November, awaiting an invasion. That seems to be a large part of the nature of war in El Salvador. This time it seems a little more serious as the people are preparing to evacuate. Everyone has prepared bundles of food and clothes to carry. The people here give me strength. They're calm and courageous in the midst of potential disaster. We have to keep them well hidden in the day. If the spotter planes that buzz overhead see a concentration of people, they'll call an airstrike or fire their own white phosphorus rockets into our midst. There was one baby born en route. I saw her a few hours later. What strength the mother. She kept right on going afterwards. Later in the evening, I had my radio turned to a Salvadoran station that played Christmas carols. It seemed rather bizarre in the midst of all this. I thought I knew what I was bargaining for when I made the decision to go to El Salvador. I knew that over 40,000 civilians had already died as a result of the violence, that 25% of all children died before age five of malnutrition-related causes, I was as well prepared as anyone could be. I had grown up with a sense of service. I was a distinguished graduate of the Air Force Academy and as a Vietnam veteran knew a little bit about a combat zone. But I couldn't help but wonder what I, Charlie Clements, was doing as a doctor in the front lines of the war in El Salvador. Physicians or nurses who treat patients with wounds are considered subversive as well. So you can't buy gauze in San Salvador. We began using mosquito netting because people buying gauze came under suspicion. And then people began disappearing that bought mosquito netting. And then we began buying diapers. Before I left the front, a woman who was coming back on a bus was taken off of a bus because she didn't have the election stamp and her ID card that made her suspicious automatically. The soldiers demanded to know why a poor peasant would have cloth diapers in her bag and she didn't have an adequate answer and they knew they were used for gauze and she lost her life as a result. I'm not talking about some area off in the jungles. I was 20 miles from San Salvador. I could see the hotel the journalist stayed in on a clear day. there two years ago, I went there because I feared that another Vietnam War was developing. I went overland and I was in a hotel room waiting to be taken in for some time and was listening to radio reports about what was going on within El Salvador. I had been promised uh, three conditions of service. One, that uh, my medical neutrality would be respected, that as a, a Quaker uh, I wasn't going to bear arms and that I could work with civilians. There was a particularly potent offensive against an area called Guasapa, and then the Salvadoran commander came on and said that the slopes of the volcano were on fire, the terrorist stronghold had been eliminated, and I kind of breathed a sigh of relief, thinking, well, I won't be going to that hellhole. And then 10 days later, I found myself marching into that area, and my distinct impression was the smell of war from a long ways off, the smell of burned flesh, the smell of fields, the smell of charred houses, which were all a result of, of that offensive in that area would be my home for the next year. One of my first patients was a woman with a young infant who was breastfeeding the whole time I was treating an abscess in her calf. She got a grenade fragment in her calf when she was nine months pregnant. She walked for three days without treatment and then delivered her child. The abscess is now two months old, and we're attempting to drain it through the original site of entry that had been scarred over.
una gran barba, que por eso le teníamos desconfianza, solo por la barba. Como decían que iban los, esos gringos, para los yanquis. Y así que se le llamamos parecido a nosotros. Y nosotros por eso le teníamos más miedo a la barba, no confiábamos, decimos que eran de los malos. Después ya nosotros confiábamos en él, que íbamos a pedir la medicina y todo. Íbamos siempre al hospital donde él allí. Él curó hasta de la úlcera, todo. ¿no? Nos daba así las medicinas. ¿no? Él hacía sus medicinas de hierbas y todo. Le enseñó a las demás a hacer, preparar medicinas de hierbas, jarabes, ¿no? para los niños que tenían todo. Y ahí ya toda la gente le agarramos la confianza y ya él, ya todos lo conocíamos por compañero ahí también. Porque él así los trataba también de compañeros a todos nosotros. A mí los dos muchas vidas ahí. Y yo pues tengo recuerdos de él porque este, él me salvó la vida, la cota que tengo allá. Y a ese niñito que tengo aquí, este, ese niño estaba bien pechistillo, ya me iba a morir. Y él me dijo que no perdiera la fe, que dio medicinas y vitaminas para mí. One of the first patients I came to know as I mentioned was Camila, who at 38 was in the midst of her eighth pregnancy. Camila told me that she had three living children, and upon inquiry said that she had had one miscarriage. And I asked her a question I would learn to ask very differently. I asked her what happened to the others. There was a, a flood of anguish, and she went through the litany telling me her first son died in the year of drought, and her second son died in the year there was too much rain, and it was the litany that peasants would go through who paid 50% of what they produced to the landlords or to the lenders, and who in a good year could survive on that. And in a bad year, the choices were this. Go ahead and pay the landlord or the lender and watch another child grow hungry, or go ahead and feed the children one more year and then watch their land be repossessed. And watch land that had grown corn and beans and sorghum, what they eat three times a day, then be replanted in cotton or coffee or sugar cane or be used to graze cattle. The peasants told me about what happened to them in the 60s. Patients like Camila, who belonged to a base Christian community. We might call that a Bible study group, but began to talk about something called liberation theology. In its simplest form, as the peasants said it, what they heard was that their misery wasn't the result of God's will, but was the result of a few men's greed. And it was an inspiration not to pick up arms, but to organize. And in these base Christian communities, they, a group about this size, they would discuss the message of social justice in the gospel. Organization like that, a change of the status quo, was perceived as a threat. And a popular slogan in the 70s was, be patriotic, kill a priest. Any one of you for participating in a meeting like this in Salvador would be risking your life. Because first, the death squads blamed the priests that brought this message, and they killed a number of them. And they came after the leaders of the cooperatives that had sprung up, because a lot of agricultural cooperatives were another result of this message. As that happened, the sons and daughters of the campesinos that were the targets of these attacks began to, to respond, and they began to ambush the death squads. Every effort at bringing about nonviolent change was met with greater and greater repression, and one just has to look at the history of El Salvador in the 60s and 70s to, to understand why there's revolution today. I didn't find a people who would willingly turn toward violence, but a people who were faced with no other alternative. It became an issue of survival for them. Could you say something about your commitment to nonviolence as a Quaker and how you feel about the, what the guerrillas do? You know, their violence. I know you worked closely with them or amongst them. How did you kind of reconcile, reconcile that with your Christian faith as you? Well, that is a very difficult question and one that I wrestle with every day in Salvador. Would I pick up? a gun and defend a wounded patient if I knew that that patient was going to be tortured by the Salvador military. Uh, I would refuse to carry a weapon and then they would send somebody in front of me with a machine gun and somebody was behind me to guard me because they said, 
if you won't defend yourself, we will because you're a precious resource. You're the only doctor we have for the civilian population. Uh, those kind of contradictions were difficult. The hospital is just an adobe house with a small fire room at one end for cooking, a tiny room on the other end that has a bed in it, and a large main room with six beds. The only furniture is wood or bamboo. Everything is dusty. There's a porch the length of the main room. It has several hammocks and two wooden benches. In front is a small banana grove. There are only four patients in the hospital. Many come here to have bandages changed daily, but once they're well enough, they stay elsewhere. The nurses are very good about dressing changes considering the conditions. The medical situation in El Salvador was very primitive and nothing like medicine practice in this country. In an operation, I would be pleased if there was a full team there, someone to brush away flies, someone to give some anesthesia, someone to pass instruments. Those were the realities of medical care in El Salvador. As I began to see those patients, there were calls again, there were echoes of Vietnam as we dispatched more military aid to Salvador. I began to hear things similar to what I'd heard as a young man. At that time it was, if we don't stop them in Vietnam, we'll have to stop them at the Golden Gate Bridge. I was at the Air Force Academy and believed that we needed to stop them in Vietnam. And I went there to do that and learned firsthand about our involvement in Asia. I first met Charlie in uh, Lubbock, Texas at Reese Air Force Base in pilot training. And uh, we were in the 50th Tactical Airlift Squadron and we flew C-130s, which is a large uh, four-engine turboprop uh, airplane that is built to withstand a lot of battle damage and make short field landings on rough uh, strips and rough runways. So it's particularly suited to Vietnam with all the uh, jungle and the short mountain strips. On a typical day for us, we might get up at 3 in the morning and uh, launch at 5 a.m. Maybe our first trip for the day would be to fly 40,000 pounds of bombs from uh, Cameron Bay down to uh, Queen Anne in the Delta area. And then that might get us down in Queen Anne at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we might then convert to carrying troops for two or three hours and carry troops up to Da Nang. There was something terribly ironic about us bringing, for example, new fresh combat troops in who had just arrived from the United States and then returning ourselves to these air-conditioned billets where uh, we ate steak and lobster every night in the officers' club looking out at the pretty lights out on the bay. And we didn't really participate in being shot at ourselves. And there were special beaches for the officers and uh, water skied on our days off for free all day long. You could water ski. It was, as a major friend of mine told me, the tour of a lifetime. He'd been in the Air Force for 22 years, and he said he'd never had anything like this. This was by far the best tour he'd ever had in his life, and we all felt the same way. But there were these times that would come when you'd be carrying, for example, a dead body that might have been in a rice paddy for two or three days, and when the smell of the body would pervade the cockpit air and drift forward from the cargo compartment into the cockpit, it became difficult to avoid confronting what you were actually doing. And that proved to be a real burden for Charlie because of his analytical mind. He could not just shut his mind off. He would think about what we were doing, what it meant, what it meant for our country, what it meant for the Air Force, the welfare of the Air Force. Like a good Air Force Academy man, he had the big picture. They're always telling you to keep the big picture, think policy. He was thinking policy all the time he was in Vietnam. Well, I went to the Air Force Academy because I was groomed to do so probably from an early age. My father was an Air Force officer. My brother went to the Academy. This was also the early 60s, and President Kennedy was saying, don't ask what the country can do for you, but what you can do for the country, and it fit very well with my whole notion of service. I know that he felt a very strong obligation to do whatever his country asked him to do. Just to give you an example of the frame of mind he was in, I just happened to find a letter that Charlie had sent me some time ago. The hippies are everywhere pleading their causes like the martyrs they imagine themselves to be. I am convinced that they are representative of nothing but themselves. He goes on to say they have rallies at noon every day bragging about how they ran from cops or discovered a new loophole for the draft. <laughs> 
or to gather funds for an underground pornography sheet that provides funds for demonstration materials. I can remember very clearly one time doing push-ups uh, in the mud and, and hearing civilians uh, over on the wall laughing at us, as, as, they, as they often did, as we were harassed and being told, grin and bear it, mister. You're going to be defending those same people who are laughing at you someday, and they'll look at you with respect. I was going to Asia with the idea that I would probably defend some of these people's rights to protest and that I had access to much more information than they did and, and I had a clearer picture of this global threat that we were confronting. After six months in Asia and, and more than 50 combat missions, I would change my mind about our role there and, and my participation in it. I can't pinpoint the date, but a, a lieutenant in my squadron began to tell me about the Phoenix program, and it began to turn my stomach. They would often just eliminate whole villages, and then it would be ascribed to some search and destroy operation, but there were some operations like that in which there was no distinction made between civilians and combatants or sympathizers and non-sympathizers. I recall uh, flying over large areas of, uh, of Southeast Asia, sometimes in Laos, uh, sometimes in Cambodia, sometimes in Vietnam, that literally looked like the moon. Acres of pockmarked earth right where I was flying over, and I could see an area being bombed below. And, and I realized that even as a non-combatant, which my role was classified as, that I was certainly contributing and participating in the destruction that was going on. I think the biggest factor probably was seeing the president of the United States lie to the public and know that he had to be lying, that he knew what was going on when he came on the air one day and said there were no combat troops in Laos. What were the facts? There are no American combat troops in, in Laos. Well, I had classmates flying in civilian flight suits out of unmarked airplanes there. I knew we had already lost about 300 planes there at the time he said that. Those secret bases they were flying out of were guarded by special forces. American involvement in it. We are interdicting the Ho Chi Minh Trail as it runs through Laos. Beyond that, I do not think the public interest would be served by any further discussion. All right. I made the decision not to fly anymore on April 30th, uh, 1970. That was the day before the invasion of Cambodia. I had flown 12 to 14 sorties to an area near the Parrot's Beak, uh, which was the jumping off point for that invasion. Uh, that wasn't a fully developed decision at that time. I just knew I had to leave Saigon and that I didn't want to participate anymore. I didn't know what the consequences of that decision were or how it would unfold. I knew I just had to get out and that I wasn't going to fly anymore. I was in California, a civilian, uh, and uh, I had been out of the Air Force about two weeks or a month or something like that. And about that time, Charlie uh, came home on a leave and uh, he visited me in San Francisco. And when Charlie came, there was going to be a big demonstration uh, against the war. So we went to this uh, demonstration in San Francisco State, and it was a rather unusual experience. I had been in the Air Force uh, for a number of years. I had never been to a demonstration. Uh, we were probably three of the only people in our 20s uh, uh, on, on that campus that had never been to a demonstration before. Uh, we still had our short hair, and uh, uh, Charlie was uh, still in the Air Force, just on leave. And uh, the crowd was very unruly and uh, not like the kind of things we're used to in the Air Force, which is some order. And I can't remember how the arrangements were made, but we were supposed to give a little talk. And uh, speaker after speaker would denounce the war. Charlie got up uh, very quietly and humbly, walked up onto the stage and began speaking in a very low tone of voice, the first low tone of voice that had come across that loudspeaker all day, and uh, very quietly addressed that crowd and just explained that he was a captain in the Air Force on leave, he's back in Vietnam, that we'd seen a lot of terrible things. And he said it in such a way that the crowd, to my utter amazement, and I still am stunned to this day, quieted down, and they gave him a big round of applause when he finished. I stressed veterans could be a great strength in the anti-war movement. I also said many people were saying no in different ways. Some burned their draft cards, others asked for a CO status, others refused second tours, and that my way of saying no was to fly no more combat missions. When Charlie refused to fly anymore in Vietnam, he was sent back to uh, the big base in San Antonio, it escapes my mind for a moment, uh, and uh, placed in a uh, 
in a hospital and put under psychiatric observation because the Air Force just could not deal with someone of his caliber refusing to fly. They couldn't, the only possible explanation they could come up with for an act of that kind was that his, his mind must have gone on him, perhaps briefly, maybe permanently, but the Air Force could not adjust to Charlie Clements deciding that their war was insane. And it was easier for them to say that he was insane. When I think back to, to what happened, I'm not sure where I got the, the courage to do it. Uh, I would talk to, to nurses whom I thought were educated people, and they would say I was being hostile if I showed anger at being locked up. Uh, if I didn't want to, uh, to talk to other patients, I was labeled antisocial. Uh, if I didn't want to take a, a medicine that they asked me to take, then I was uh, told that I would be strapped down and given an injection if I didn't uh, be more cooperative. When you take somebody and you take away his Air Force uniform, you take away his, his airplane, take him away from the role he was in, take away the G-suit and all the fancy things that go with being a pilot, and put him in a, in a hospital ward and give him one of these little, little, uh, little hospital nighties to go around in, a little gown, you've stripped him, literally, of everything that made him an individual. You know, a couple of days is a long time. He was in there many days, finally weeks and then months. That's a long, long time to think about what you've thrown away. A flying career, a future, everything you always thought you were. His whole life, he'd been a military man. And it hurt him a lot to give all that up. One thing that uh, I thought about a lot was the callousness that I had developed with regard to, to life itself. I remember specifically uh, picking up the body of a good friend once and, and, and not having the luxury to, uh, to mourn at all, to, to grieve, not uh, just knowing that those emotions weren't possible. And after one does that enough, you begin to tune out life and begin to treat it very callously. And uh, I didn't want it to happen to me again. And as a result, I made a personal commitment to nonviolence that would be a, a daily reminder of, of how one can become. heard that Charlie Clements had gone to El Salvador and hiked in there with a backpack of medical supplies on his back. I felt worried, of course. I was worried about Charlie. He very well could have been killed down there. But I was just delighted to see that not everybody pulls in their head like a turtle as they get older and uh, becomes unwilling to take risks and do things for other people. Charlie apparently had not compromised at all. And so here's this guy who had been brought down as low as he could be by the Air Force, hiking in El Salvador with a backpack on his back. I thought it was just splendid. There was one very poor family a mother, two daughters, and granddaughter who insisted on giving us a cup of coffee en route. The woman told a heartbreaking story about how they killed her 62-year-old husband who was hiding in a hole because he couldn't run in the last invasion. Then using dogs, they found the holes where they had buried their food and another few belongings. They burned it all, shot the livestock, and then to top it off, chopped down the avocado tree and the three fruit trees. She says she won't leave. I wonder about the woman and so many others living in houses with caved-in roofs from fires or bombs. There was hardly a day the last six months in which there wasn't either an attack by American-supplied A-37 fighter bombers or strafing by helicopters that would pass over or rocketings by these observation craft. We had trenches by many of the houses, but we started an intense program of, of building bomb shelters. And sometimes after an attack like that, children wouldn't come out of the caves or the elderly people would just sit there in the mud, trembling. Yeah. 
porque ellos buscaban los caserillos donde vivía uno a tirarle. Y él salía a ver, pues después del borbandeo salían a ver ellos los grandes hoyos que hacía. Como piscinas servían ya en el invierno los hoyos que hacían las bombas. Los niños los hacía pedacitos. No se hallaban los niños a veces. Día y noche. Día y noche pues llega a tirar. Entonces, este, ya él, ya él pues ya tiene allí su, su ejército pues, que ya no sale de WhatsApp. Y entonces nosotros, cuando logran ellos localizarlos a nosotros, pues sí, porque los que mueren son los niños y los ancianos. Pues. Y uno de, así pues, pero como sabe que no tiene cómo defenderse, los que morimos somos nosotros y los niñitos y los ancianos, como ya no pueden caminar. White phosphorus was used practically every day the last months I was there because of the observation craft using it as a primary anti-personnel weapon. It has particularly devastating effects because of the temperature with which it burns. Uh, muscle fat and other deep tissue is instantly coagulated and it becomes embedded in tissues and often smolders, even reignites long after initial trauma. So it's a particularly horrible anti-personnel weapon. I think it's particularly ironic that when Charlie was down there in this Gazapa Front region, uh, he was being uh, bombed, and uh, his area was being bombed, every day by A-37s, which are the combat version of the T-37 that Charlie and I both flew, learned how to fly down in Lubbock, Texas in 1967. So here we are 15 years later, and a man who came from a military family, had nothing but the highest and finest military ideals and tradition, has come full circle from sitting in the cockpit with his oxygen mask and his helmet and flying this A-37, T-37. 15 years later, he has ended up with a backpack down in this jungle, down in El Salvador, getting bombed by the airplane we used to fly. As I left the Guasapa front, some of the people there asked me why it was I didn't carry a gun. And I was talking a little bit about what it meant to be a Quaker, uh, because most of the doctors there carried guns, and about violence and nonviolence. And one of the campesinos looked me in the eye and he said, shook his head and he said, you gringos have some real strange conceptions of violence. He said, you're real worried about what gets done with machetes and machine guns. He said, I worked on the hacienda over here and I would have to feed those dogs bowls of meat or, or bowls of milk every morning and I could never put those on the table for my children. And he said, when my ch children were ill, they died with a nod of sympathy from the landlord, but when those dogs were ill, I took them to the, to the veterinarian in Suchi Toto. He said, you will never understand violence or nonviolence until you understand the violence to the spirit that happens from watching your children die of malnutrition. And that's what the issue is about in Central America today. <laughs>